<clears throat> so, um, of course, as I said, our host, our, v, our Vancouver Island Regional Library host is Darby Love. And tonight's program will be divided into two parts. Part one will provide us with an opportunity to get to know some of the poets who participated in the anthology through some of their work. The second part will introduce some poems from Old Bones and Battered Bookends, the anthology that we're celebrating tonight, and these poems will be read by their authors. So now on to part one. This activity will be conducted as a round robin where the poets will present poems under the headings something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. I will start off the process with something old, me. This is a short poem about the experience of dancing to Danny's All-Star Joint by Ricky Lee Jones, several decades since it first worked its way into my toes. For this poem, I worked on internal, internal and an internal rhyme scheme, which got challenging at points, but it was thrilling to dance along with. So here it is, it's a short one. It's called Ricky Lee, Still Percolating in My Bones. I'm dancing again to that same old song. 40 years down the line since the first time. Taking these aching old bones of mine along for this, my return to the scene of the crime. The hipster chick with the boozy inflection steps up to the mic, serves her myth on a riff. A badass sassafras confection, an insurrection. Breezy vocalese over easy and swift as a whiff. She meows and she purrs in a pussy cat voice, spins her spell, revs one up for the bandstand, drops a quarter in the jukebox, doit, doit, croons a tune in a jazz cat scat attack that could, does, did, and will rival any man. Okay, and now we'll proceed to the second person. I, if, I believe he's here, Derek Hanabury. He was perhaps gonna be late, but uh, Derek, if you're here, you're next in line with a something old poem. Is Derek here? Oh, well, Derek, I, th I think he's here. Okay, we might just skip to the next person and catch Derek later. So how about Anne Hopkinson? Something old. Sure, something old for me. Um, it seems to me that um, somewhere between middle-aged and elderly, women tend to become invisible. And uh, that's kind of good. So this is a poem about that. It's called Between Equals Invisible. <clears throat> between 50 and 70, between blonde and gray, the spotlight rests on young and cool, famous and criminal, as I weave through the crowd, unseen in plain view. Disguised in neutral coloring, cloaked in the anonymity of a certain age, men's eyes flick past sexual scanners on a different wavelength. Camouflaged in comfortable shoes and elastic waist slacks, I sing all the words to Santana's smooth, fire political debate to the breeze, list the men I'd like to jump and the men I'd like to thump. Between athletic and arthritic, between candid and cantankerous. Never chosen as a volunteer from the audience, never offered a seat on the bus or a hand on the steps, no Tuesday discounts, but also no leering guys in the pub, no unlicited photos on the beach. Under the radar, I flourish, invisible and unlimited. Between 2.0 and has been, between MILF and Chrome. Thank you. Okay, and we're continuing with this theme. And next up is Keith Garabian. Garabian, is that it? Okay, you need to unmute yourself, Keith. There you go. Okay. Did I get it right? Is it Garabian? 
Arabian. Arabian, yes. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, mine is a glossa, and for those who may not know what that form is, it implies taking four consecutive lines from another poet and using each of those four lines as the final line in a ten-line stanza, okay? So this one is called Lost in Old Age. And the lines I'm using are from a Debbie Durango Adams, Gravity and Grace, and they read as follows. But perhaps that is how the bell tolls. Dreams are revealed upon our quivering eyelids as we sleep to rouse the infinite. Now here's my poem. A tugging animal in my throat, cancer's inner predation. Siren sound inside the body, throat heavier than my chest. Radiation scars, stark mementos of reckoning with wreckage. Coping itself a sadness beneath the deep cerulean sky, sounding notes deeper than blue, but perhaps that is how the bell tolls after brief respite, a moment of health when my body brushed with joy seemed purer, my heart anchored in love with roiling life, in art, in soulful places, echoing small sounds of gratitude lighting up a moon in the bosom of a ravished world where dreams are revealed as we wander and wonder, lonely but on purpose. Attempting to imagine otherwise, we wish what matters quintessentially, then discover, lost in old age, we're extravagant to the universe's phantom design, writing ourselves on sand, in water, our best dreams upon our quivering eyelids, or trapped in a bottle ship drifting on sea foam. Our meaning at the mercy of tides promising no safe arrival. The ocean in a beach shell, we want the song of ourselves to echo in hypnotic waves. Pain salted with tears and sweat, our exhausted wake as we sleep to rouse the infinite. Okay, and now we have uh, a voice from the darkness. We have Michael <laughs> Penny up next. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I should explain that uh, my internet at home has been out for a week or so, and living on Little Island, uh, TELUS will not be here until tomorrow. So I am sitting in the parking lot of the public library here, which is dark, in my car. And God bless the library. And by the way, Darby, God bless libraries everywhere. Thank you, uh, Michael. <laughs> because they leave their internet on. Um, I'm going to and... share that with the Gabriola librarian. He's going to be so excited to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I just opened the door of my car so I could read the poem. <laughs> so this is a, a little bit different idea of old. And the fantasy is that, and maybe this is because I lost the internet this week, the fantasy is that the internet has been around forever. And uh, this uh, poem will, will appear in the Salzburg Review of all places. In any event, it's called The Internet Expands. Was I going to Shakespeare's new play? I'd liked Hamlet and got the Facebook invite. Pop-ups from the Delphi fortune tellers interrupt Plato's YouTube video. Caesar is trending in the latest conspiracies. Somebody has ripped Christ, ignoring the no cell phone sign at his sermon. I read Paul's emails, but accidentally reply all and get flamed by believers. A Neanderthal LinkedIn contact laments the lack of hunter-gatherer jobs. The Buddha pronounces no worries, but then the link to Nirvana is broken. The debris from the Big Bang keeps flying outwards, confirming our existence. I will lose the belly fat, retire with a million dollars, and find singles to meet. Thank you. Now I'm going back in the dark. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Okay, and so uh, next up for the last one in the old, uh, something old category is Janice Lore.
This is an old poem um, because it took place over a thousand years ago. A Viking in Constantinople. We sailed across the Baltic Sea to Kiev and Rus, then down the Slavuta River, looting among warlike people. Near the Dnieper Rapids, the Kangar nomads shadowed us along the riverbank. Fierce wraiths showering us with arrows in the shallows of the ford. At the southern shore of the Black Sea, we met a diplomacy utterly beyond us. We were warriors, bewildered by a turn of phrase, our weapons more useless than flowers. What could we do but trade our furs and honey sign on as mercenaries to the emperor. Some say that we have been tamed, the heat melting the fierce instincts of the North. But it is not that. I have a hunger, finally slaked by the exotic spice of the cooking, the filigreed stone and glass mosaics, of these palaces, churches, and baths. The vast libraries of learning, philosophy, mathematics, astronomy. Why would I return to Sweden to work the clay soil of a poor farm? I would rather serve an empire that can float vaulted stone in halos of light then be buried in a king's ship in a cold mound of earth, then live again or die so far from the sun. Okay, so now we're gonna switch over to the next topic, which is something new. And to get us started on this one, uh, I invite Daniela Lorenzi. Thank you, Ian. Uh, this is new as of, um, I guess, well, December. It happened in December. And it's exactly what it says, French beach is burning. It was um, just a sensation I had standing on French beach when I'd never had before. So I tried to describe it. So here it is. French beach is burning. A seashore heavy with rock, Obsidian, alabaster, stippled gray, undulating knolls of wave polished stones, sprinkled with opaque shards of tinted glass, opalescent shells, and glistening bullwhip kelp, that seaweed siren with flaming auburn hair, seen floating tranquil on the water, now log tangled, earthbound. White caps explode relentless onto this flowing shore. Watery detonations that grasp the tree line, that phalanx of ancient windswept hunchbacks. As breakers crash, ponderous waves of rock hold their ground, and the raucous surf retreats around the polished agates and flower stones, releasing startling sounds of roaring fire that crackles and sizzles in between steadfast dallasites and tangled seagrass on this cold December day. Thank you, Thank Daniela. You. Uh, okay, and for something new from Andrew Brown as well. Okay, hi, is my voice okay, Ian? Yep, Pretty it's good. Good, good. Uh, thank you, Ian and Pat and Derby, uh, for putting this on. This is a uh, new poem from January 2021. So uh, trying it out here. Uh, it's in three sections, and uh, they're all short. You know, don't sweat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I'll just say um, uh, the section number uh, before I read it. Number one, I am the candle 
You are the knife I cleanse. Pass your blade through my, through my neck, slow as you please, or flick it through faster than war. I continue to burn. I light the room just the same, despite your knife moves, flickering. Two, I am the fire under the kettle, you the cold water, I turn into steam with my persistent heat, with my infinite patience. I make you a burning vapor. Three, I am the sun you tried to prove exists. You stayed up all night speaking to anyone who would listen about my endless heat. By the time I rose over the mountains, you had all fallen asleep. You only woke after I said, will we ever meet? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're back to Michael in his dark car for a new or something new. That's up to him to decide what makes it new. There you go. What, what I'm doing is opening the door so the light will go on. <laughs> but uh, by the way, shout out to my Writers Guild of our Buddha Buddies, Anna and Richard. Great to see you. Yeah. Um, so you might have noticed that the, the poems have been getting newer as this section has proceeded. And I'm going to create an impossible problem for Fiona, the next reader, because I finished this thing about an hour ago. <laughs> it's called... Uh, the premise is that it's a Zoom thing, but all the people on the Zoom are me and all my possible lives. So it's called Zoom Through a Glass Darkly. <laughs> I reach my other selves in the universes next door via a black hole Zoom. We know each other so well, but left-handed and living other lives all my ages and agendas of how we got the life we have and the others all line up now, squared in gallery view. All the same name and settings, videos lit on and sound unmuted. There is no red oval to click for leave. And that proves that all me in my multitude is still known there and invited to the meeting. Well, thank you for inviting us to your meeting, Michael. Uh, so Fiona uh, Tinwe Lam is next, and she uh, has a poem that straddles several of her categories. So I just randomly slotted her into new. So take it away, Fiona. Thanks so much, Ian. And it's wonderful to be here with all of you. Thanks for coming out and attending the reading. And it's a pleasure and honor to be in this anthology uh, as well. So I'm going to read um, a poem from my new collection, and it's about feet, but it starts out with baby feet. And it's actually feet in utero and then moves into the future. Ode to Feet. Little buds furled and unfurled. How you drummed in patience against your underwater cave arrived kicking away earth and sky. We hold you now in our palms, rub you with our thumbs, preparing you for life's surfaces. Are you ready? You'll anchor wandering through mud and sand, expanses of floor and road. Thickened, coarsened, harnessed to haul the body's heft, you'll tramp through homes, towns, fields with only a sporadic sprint, skip, sachet, a brief caress before night's horizontal release. Muffled and cased through the day, you'll still speak, a tap, stomp, sharp swerve of the heel. Thank you, Fiona, and that you really nailed new with that one for sure. So now we're going to move over to Something Borrowed, and uh, Janice Lore is going to start us off with that one. Uh, 
This is another Viking poem, actually. Um, a common motif in Viking Age art is a strange creature called a gripping beast. Its hands and feet clutch at various parts of its own body. This is an ekphrastic poem and thus borrowed, uh, written after I first saw a gripping beast in the Viking Ship Museum in Roskilde, Denmark. And I've used an Icelandic term that the Vikings used when they became lost at sea. Havila, meaning bewildered, all sense of direction lost. The gripping beast. It will find you. The fierce north squalling in, squatting behind round shields in the open longboats. Square sails set by the sagas and a sunstone. Square sails set by the sagas and a sunstone. Running Havila in the fog and gales. Useless to set the beacon fires. The beast has already slipped in. Dragons surging up the river on the tide plundering even the abbeys, the barbaric hand that grips your throat, your own. Thank you. And now another borrowed poem from Andrew. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I borrowed a bit of influence here from uh, Emily Dickinson. This poem is called, If You Think of Death. If you think of death, think of it as an old friend, one who would do anything for you, even give you the sheet off his bed to cover your bleached white bones as you lie like a shipwreck on the sand. When you think of death, think, it, think of it as a city you love, a place of squares with sidewalk cafes serving dark coffee in porcelain cups. Think of how you sat there one afternoon with paper in front of you and wrote this poem. If you think of death, think of it as a bus stop on a country road. There is a small shelter only a roof over a green bench, its paint worn as you sit and wait in the sun for the bus to arrive and take you away. When you think that death may have touched your shoulder, try not to shudder. Or if death kisses you, do not turn the other cheek. There may be a message intended for your ears alone. So try to make out every word, because in each friendship there is loss, because all cities contain streets you've not yet walked down, because no matter how long the wait, a bus will come, because a caress felt is never an unkindness, because a word from death equals all the novels you've read, so if you think of death as dust, think of it also as blood beating in an underground heart. Think of that terrible, beautiful moment when you were a child and you realized death was possible. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Lovely. Okay, so it's back to me again. I have a borrowed poem. And uh, this poem is borrowed, in a sense, from all the zombie culture out there. Movies, TV shows, graphic novels, even reimaginings of Jane Austen's work. I realized I didn't have a zombie poem and set out to address that gap. But I had to wonder what in a poem would be something the writer might want to kill off as per that familiar zombie trope and realized it could well be cliches. So I have tackled that in this poem. And uh, I just want to warn you that a zombie poem must of necessity contain a generous amount of hyperbole. There is no way around it. So this poem is called Abomination Buster. 
Here is my zombie poem. Hey, I'm no pop culture pariah. A poem chock full of dead metaphors and comatose cliches. Their woe begone, listless corpses crawling as we speak from within a repository of useless dead stuff, a fetid mass of decomposition in the graveyard of failed potential. They roam at night, these zombies, when our guard is down, when we are at our most vulnerable, their lifeless eyes opaque, unseeing yet ablaze with flesh lust, a hunger for blood and guts and gooey things, for any hapless chump killing time on the fringes of a stanza. The walking dead attack voraciously, tenaciously, yet with precision, despite their awkward zombie gait and obvious demeanor. And so, we must assail them in equal measure with savagery and determination, dismember them, decapitate them, spare no amount of blood, slime, or viscera in our slugfest sluggard slaughter. We cannot allow them to have their way with our poetry, their gaping mouths oozing with blood and sinew. <coughs> Sorry, with their gaping mouths oozing with the blood and sinew of our best new efforts. Kill them, kill them brutally, mercilessly, and as graphically as you can. <laughs> So a bit of a flub there, but anyhow, uh, that was actually great fun to write. Uh, so now we're ready to part, uh, pass on to the next theme, which is something blue. And we're going to start with Anna for that one, something blue. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, Mary and Derek, especially for being part of the reading. Um, um, blue now you see i have a blue necklace that's one thing that's blue in this poem and the other one is that a combination of the pandemic and the arctic vortex here in uh, in edmonton at the beginning of february can add up to the deepest shade of blue um it almost did then i realized one morning that we have an indoor bathroom which i didn't until i was 14. <laughs> so I felt much better, and hence the poem. It's called it the 12th month of the pandemic. Granted the morning, granted the diligence of daylight, which tugs on my optic nerve, releasing a flood of hormones. Granted eyelids, which understand the command to slide up, granted the gift of discerning inner from outer. Granted uprightness, the ability to advance, granted the mind boggling luxury of an indoor bathroom, granted water laboring from underground tanks, granted the river, the natural gas, the know-how granted the pleasure of hot jets on skin, the steam oiling my mucous membranes. Granted flexible joints, arms long enough to scrub shoulder blades, feet which acquiesce and acquiesce, granted soap in the soap dish, the rosemary shampoo, Granted the drugstore which replenishes, the company which manufactures and delivers, granted the women and the men. Granted the kindness of a soft towel, clean underwear, granted the freedom of this shirt and not that one. Granted the lambency of a February banana, the presence of the men slicing it into the fruit salad. Thank you. I like that last image. Um, okay, so now we're on to Pat Smeckle, and uh, she's going to bring us something blue. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Anyway, it's good to be here. Um, some years ago, I was in Honolulu, and at a hostel, I met uh, an interesting young man who happened to be blind. This poem is called, You Don't Need Eyes to See. 
I know blue. Blue is born in the north where it spreads itself on space and inhabits backgrounds. Sometimes sad and moody, but never gets rowdy or rough. If I want to touch it, I need to reach high, reach deep, let a moth's wing brush my cheek, feel silk between my toes. I hear it whenever I eavesdrop on murmurs and hummingbirds too, or listen to Rai Cooter's slide guitar. When I want to taste it, I'll avoid strong flavors. I imagine tea brewed from sea breezes sipped slowly from a bowl my mother made. I can catch its scent in bed linen taken fresh from the line or inside a book opened for the first time. After a storm, I step outside just to breathe it in. I know blue, it's modest, mellifluous, cool. You don't need eyes to see it. Lewis, great word. Okay, Daniela, do you have something blue for us? Oops, you're, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, sorry, I, yeah, I didn't have my mic down. Well, so I wasn't sure. No, I didn't have my mic down. I'm trying not to. Anyhow, uh, yes, do you have something blue for us, Daniela? I, I do, I do. Um, uh, this is about uh, blue jeans. I never thought I'd be able to read this poem. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, and of course, as all of us have been wearing blue jeans for a very long time, um, and we don't think about it, I think, I, you know, I take, I take mine for granted for sure. And a couple of years ago, I started looking into it. I guess I read something that um, told me I should do that. So there's a very, uh, I found some interesting facts about blue jeans and how they're made and how maybe uh, I should pay more attention to blue jeans and where I buy them, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, forever in blue jeans. From Genovese sailors to Levi and Strauss, from ranch to farm to Vogue, cattle branding and corn picking, Fifth Avenue lunching and Alabama lynchings, rebelling with Brando and Dean, beatnicking with Ginsburg and Kerouac. The humble gene has marched, rags to riches, shit to style, the must have of every closet. Still branding after all these years with caustic dyes that seep into feet of flip-flopped workers as they slosh in factories in Bangladesh that flow into runoff ponds where laborers fish for dinner, blue-hued catch of the day, with elastic plastic fibers that help me bend, that unlike me, do not break down, but live on and on and on along with the indigo in my distressed blue jeans. Mm. That was an important poem. <laughs> um, okay, and Fiona tells me that she has a blue poem for us. So we'll, we'll uh, finish off this round with uh, uh, one last blue poem and then we'll take a short bio break and then get down to the, uh, to the second part where we present the book. Thanks, Ian. This poem has a blue blanket in it. So wait to hear for it. And it segues into the second part of today's reading. It's from my first book, um, Intimate Distances. Rewind. A daughter recedes from her mother's mind like a reel of home movies rewinding. Smoke tendrils ravel back into eight pink birthday candles that relight with a girl's swallow of breath. 
twirling in her velvet party dress, she doesn't see the cakes retreat as her mother walks backward through the kitchen to another birthday years before. The girl returns smaller, aged five, wading on long beach in waves that rise back into the ocean, colored pebbles and shells taken from pockets and placed with care in the sand. Now a toddler stumbling back from first steps, arms aloft like marionette strings in her mother's hands, then back to crawling, past a phalanx of toys on the carpet, then just crying in a soft sky blue blanket, jogs stiffly in the arms of her resurrected father. In the hospital bed, her mother, young face unknotted from 48 hours of labor, almost smiles, but then reappears on church steps in a wedding dress white as sugar, a bouffant hairdo, mouth lipsticked dark, laughing in black and white. Gloved hands swoop down, a ribboned bouquet thrown back into her arms, new husband at her side. She retreats into the church for the undoing of unseen rites, emerges unwedded, drawn into the belly of a rolls that careens in reverse down a slim street in Paisley, turns a corner, disappears into the beginning. That's a, a nice resonant note to finish on. Uh, so we're going to now take a, a, a brief break of five minutes for uh, people to get refreshments or to have a bio break or whatever they need. And then we'll start and present the, uh, the book, which we're here to do tonight. And uh, just to let you know, the second half will be shorter than the first because each of the 10 poets that we'll be reading will be reading only one poem. So um, yeah, see you back in five minutes. Anyone who wants to stick around and converse, that's okay. Maybe we'll stop recording uh, during that part if we can, Darby. Uh, can't hear you though. Sorry, Karen, you're muted. Okay, <laughs> as long as it was fairly soon. I well, could we'll, we'll, just, we'll, we'll start with you and Keith. Okay. Yeah. Should I do the one that I did last time about the the lady walking too fast? I like that one, but yeah. you can do whichever one you want. <laughs> I'll do that one. Okay. Uh, so uh, why don't we get started on part yeah. two? Uh, in this part, we're going to highlight Old Bones and Battered Bookends, which is published by Repartee Press. It's an anthology on aging. And uh, Pat Smeckle and I were the curators. Uh, those are the word. That's the word we like to use. Uh, and we received over three hundred submissions from BC and beyond for this collection. And we narrowed it down to a mere thirty-five, which was quite a task, which uh, encompasses twenty-seven poets, uh, of whom I think we have. Uh, I'm not sure ten or eleven tonight because the, the lineup changed a little bit. Uh, and just to start things off, uh, we actually have Anne-Marie Carson from Blue Mountains, um, Ontario, who wrote our foreword, and she's going to read us a brief excerpt from that. So I turn it over to you, Anne-Marie. All right. Hello, everybody. So this was quite a privilege, uh, Pat and Ian, to be asked to write the foreword, uh, considering I'm probably one of the uh, few unpublished as yet writers in uh, that Pat and Ian know, or maybe even on this Zoom call. So um, you were blindly brave to ask me to do this, but I wanna thank all the, uh, the authors of this collection just for sharing that, uh, that humor and backbone that we all need when we age. So I'll read the excerpt. And do you ever notice that we're always just getting older? None of us seem to ever arrive at old. The poems in Old Bones and Battered Bookends contemplate one of the most profound experiences we hold in common, getting older. From the days when our progress is chronicled on door frames in inches of celebration to a growing reluctance to mark yet another milestone. 
We age in shared and yet deeply personal and sometimes solitary ways. Our need for companionship on this journey is as old as the bones of humanity. Our appreciation for getting older, like all journeys, is as much about what we pass through as what we attend to. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Okay, so uh, we're going to have a slight change. Uh, uh, if that's okay with you, Michael, we're going to slip a couple of people in that have to leave early and then, then you're up. So will uh, Keith uh, Garabian is an author. He has authored eight books of poetry and 18 books of nonfiction, including the acclaimed biography, William Hurt, Soldier Actor. Hurt. Pardon, did, oh, did I say William Hurt? Yeah. I did. <laughs> I, I did know the difference. I'll, I know who William Hurt is too. Uh, Against Forgetting is his eighth poetry collection and apparently he's working on another one, a ninth one. Actually, it's the 10th one. The ninth one is oh. coming out next spring. Oh, okay. And the poem in, in your anthology is going to be in that book. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, really it's a privilege and an honor to be included in this anthology and to be present to read and to share your company and your wonderful poems. So please excuse me for having to leave earlier than the rest of you. I hope you understand. Yeah, you live in Mississauga. Yes. <laughs> okay, the poem is called Monday Watcher and it's about a, uh, uh, an old Chinese widow from whom I bought my condo apartment. And she used to sit by the window <clears throat> and watched the lake and the park right across the road while she was rocking in a chair. Old Chinese widow sitting by the window, overlooking the park and lake, rocking gently as she watches the Monday world outside. Grime mounts on furniture, maids are cleaning for other widows, but she sits, watches, while birds are hectic in their trees. Breadwinners surge to work, stores open their shutters, and yellow school buses load kids loud with gossip about their weekend. The window doesn't matter in itself, but there is always something to see. Her three children in Hong Kong summon her to return, thinking she is much too lonely in her widowhood. She rocks in meditation. What shall she'd say of today. There is nothing sad here by the lake. What she sees best is close. To return where they need her is to lose herself, vanish and begin again. She does not miss the card games, mahjong, tea rituals, yamcha, casinos. She does not mind the cracked bathtub or peeling walls. Those wounds are not hers. Her heart is strong, lips soundless, as she prays to moving clouds. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. So uh, Kieran Egan has joined us this evening too. Uh, I didn't have him on the lineup, but he's gonna read a wonderful poem of his. And uh, I don't have an intro for you, Kieran, so maybe you could say a word or two about yourself. Um, I'm old um, and uh, I have a book coming out from uh, Silver Bow Press publishing next month called um, Amplitude, Amplified Silence. If I can't remember the name of my own book, I'm in trouble, but Amplified Silence is coming out next month. So and the poem is called Slow Down Lady. Slow down, lady, slow down. It's not pockets full of lead, but knees without cartilage, lungs with fibrosis, and too many years in which time has battered the rest of me. I stop, can't keep up with you. Watch you big stride away along the busy sidewalk. 20 seconds before you realize you're not still dragging me in your whirling wake. What's wrong, you call? Knees, lungs, time. People look from you to me, making what they can a will of it. It is just the born work die routine. You're vigorously working. I'm resting between gigs.
Thank you. Thank you. Kieran. And next up, we have Michael Penny. Michael is a Bowen Island poet who likes to sit in his car in the dark. And he <laughs> has published uh, five books, most recently, Inside, Outside from Queen's University Press. Michael. Thank you, Ian. And thank you, Ian and Pat, for including me in this anthology. Um, so my poem in the anthology is called My Skeleton. My skeleton walks in the middle of my body. Easy in its knowledge, it will outlive me. This makes it inflexible, even hard on the muscles which cling to it. It doesn't know there are parts it doesn't cage, a beating heart truly untouched by it. Yes, it cups my brain and its high electric notions, but a container is not as important as what it contains. My skeleton would like to leave now, make its own clattering way in the world, but I am too possessive, too attached to let it go. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay, and next is Anna Miodouchowska from Edmonton. And uh, her poetry, translation stories, essays, and reviews have appeared in several anthologies and literary, literary journals. And they have also aired on the CBC and CKUA. She has two po poetry collections, In Between Season and In Between Season. I didn't say that quite right. In Between Season and Some Souls Do Well in Flower Pots. Thank you, Ian and Pat, for including me in the anthology. It was a great treat. Um, <clears throat> my poem is Transformations. Uh, I find that uh, older age just kind of snuck up on me <laughs> in small steps. And this is one of those moments when I realized that I was getting there. Transformations. One look at the girl child who invites you to follow her and you know you have crossed another border. At home, among the white petals of the dental office unfolding around her, she's not the dentist daughter on the negative side of 20 visiting on career day. You listen to her explain the order of proceedings opt out of fluoride but accept polishing, vision of a gleaming smile wrestling down your inner scrooge. Mouth open wide, you submit to the ministrations and refuse to offer to the offer to watch the screen mounted to the ceiling. You fasten your attention on the exposed part of the girl's face. Make it your own for the duration. Thank you. I, I so much love that line of make it your own for the duration. It's just uh, the, the envy is palpable. <laughs> and as you age, you know that envy, right? Uh, so the next one is Daniela Lorenzi. And Daniela is a Victoria writer whose work has been published in a variety of print and online journals. And most recently in The Sky is Falling, The Sky is Falling, a pandemic anthology, which was published by Planet Earth Poetry. Thank you. Um, I am a grandmother. And what I have learned from becoming a grandmother is that I've been privileged to be able to see the world with new eyes or revisit the world with, uh, with new eyes and um, learn to laugh at myself a little bit more and not to take myself too seriously. And it's really very freeing. So this poem is, uh, I think, self-explanatory in that context. And believe it or not, it actually came out in the form of a sonnet. My grandchildren love my jiggly bits. Not a source of embarrassment, the soft pudding-like reminder of my advancing age and imminent demise. To them, 
the loose oatmeal that hangs from my arms, the doughy bulges that ooze from bathing suits and tank tops, the muffin top escaping skinny jeans, are fonts of mirth, delight, protrusions to be kneaded, jabbed and joggled, patted and prodded. They giggle and tickle and poke and bury themselves in my mass, apparently content with all the excess. Thank you, Daniela. What better way to embrace aging? This Absolutely. A, a good poem about it. Uh, <laughs> okay, so next up is Anne Hopkinson. Uh, Anne is from Victoria. She writes poetry, fiction, and nonfiction, and she is the chair of Planet Earth Poetry. Her work has appeared in several anthologies, and she won the Victoria Writers Society Creative Nonfiction Contest in 2018 and the Canadian Stories Poetry Prize in 2019. Anne. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much to both you and Pat for allowing me to be part of the book. It's great to be with all of these good poets together. Um, this poem is, um, it seems to me that this poem is about my little old Auntie Gladys, who died at 102 years of age. And it seems to me there's a certain equanimity, a certain calmness about really old little old ladies. And they have this kind of acceptance of age and stage that is really quite genuine. Missing the seven of clubs. <clears throat> but that's all right. It's the rhythm and pattern of solitaire she likes turning each card over, the red and black numbers, familiar royal families. Soft edges make it hard to shuffle, slow to deal. But that's all right. She has time and patience, no reason to get dressed, nowhere to be except the kitchen table, looking out to the back garden. It's overgrown, blackberries and dill gone wild goldenrod where she used to grow tomatoes. But that's all right. The owl clock ticks above the stove. The radio is on, some politician talking. Music she likes and the weather. Dorothy might phone. Someone might come to the door. She misses her friend, Vera. But that's all right. There are bananas and shortbread in the wooden bowl, wieners for lunch. She could make a cup of tea. She shuffles, cuts the deck, sees sun on the plum tree and a robin on the lawn. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, just as a little anecdote, um, a friend of mine told me that uh, she uh, was uh, rhapsodizing about a moment when her husband read her that poem from the anthology. So, oh, that's yeah, nice and that was the one piece of feedback that she gave me about the anthology. So, okay, so I'm up next. Uh, I am a poet from Yellow Point, BC, where I stare at nature and I will the words to come, even though they often don't. I am also the founder of 15 Minutes of Infamy, a wordcraft cabaret based in Nanaimo, uh, the writer of three volumes of poetry and the publisher of Repartee Press. Uh, the poem I'm about to read, just have to find it, is called Blink. And this poem came about uh, when I was back in Ontario visiting my mother in Mississauga, where Keith hails from, and she had two stress fractures in her back and I was assigned the task of taking her out for her first outing uh, from the hospital when she was using her walker for the first time in public. And this poem evolved out of that experience. Uh, we went into a cafe together. It's called Blink. I escort my 92-year-old mother, all hunched over her walker, as she crosses cautiously over the threshold of this generic Starbucks franchise, and we are suddenly immersed in a sea of youth. No one over the age of 25, I presume. No one, that is, but us too. 
how she stands out here in this place, the only gray hair in this whole crowd, the only one with any kind of assistive device, the only person with these age-related physical challenges. Oh, she stands out all right. Perhaps even somewhat of a decoy to camouflage my own advancing age. So I can taste a bit of invisibility while she stands out all sore thumb aged in this sea of life potential. Gently bobbing on ebb and flow like some weathered old boy marking the spot. A long line reaching downwards to the very bottom of this life. Anchored to a past meters and meters below the surface of this moment here. Two young women, still girls, but for their air of mannered maturity, look our way, try not to look our way, try not to take in this anomaly, this musty presence in this place, my sweet, unassuming, ancient mom, Gwyneth. Hear the sweet cadence of her name. Perhaps they cannot quite fathom how this phantom presence could represent a peek into their own futures, meters and meters beyond this point they inhabit on the line. They are still so buoyant, so fresh-faced, so newly painted and appointed. It will come sooner than you think I want to warn them, but who am I to shatter their illusions? Okay, so now we're back to Janice Lore, and Janice is from Tofino, BC. She writes poetry, makes handmade books, and finds great joy in playing with artists from other disciplines. Her writing has appeared in various anthologies, literary magazines, and also on CBC Radio. Janice. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> Poem for Menopausal Memory. The grim, panicked search for the poem that was just on the tip of my tongue. Now it storms around behind my eyes, hammering the wall, where a moment before there was an opening. Later, it might clunk itself into the conversation, stumbling out of the wings long after the scene has shifted. A show stopper. And so my grip is pried away, finger by finger. The forefinger, a lost ability to conjure words, no means now to explicate myself, to coax, to point to the word for the middle finger, a fruitless defiance of beauty's slow dissolution. I become lined, sagging, wattled, graying, tusked, mottled, bearded, incoherent, and unseen. The ring finger, once bright promise, worn dull, constricting, The little finger, my hand's strength lost without it, and I unable to wrap my will. The thumb last, scarred and gnarled, once opposed, now nothing left to hold. Thank you, Janice. That at was the end at the end of words. Oh. 
at the end of words, a question I cannot remember asking. The answer I once thought I knew. Thank you. Sorry about that, Janice. I should have had my book open. <laughs> Every MC's uh, uh, greatest fear to interrupt something before it's finished. I misread your pause, sorry. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, we're next on to Fiona Tinwe Lam. Fiona is a writer from Vancouver whose most recent book is Odes and Laments, published with Caitlin Press in 2019. She is also the host of Inverse, a monthly poetry forum uh, with the BC Federation of Writers. Fiona. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Pat. And um, thanks to everyone involved in getting this book out in the world and, and circulating it and reading their poems. I'm going to read a poem um, about falling in love later in life. Um, it happened to me. It can happen to anybody. <laughs> Mirror, mirror. Mirrors lie. We're as young as the young who saunter and stride past us and make out at crosswalks. We're fledgling souls and old casings until someone offers us a seat on the bus. Only then do we wither. Juice versus desiccation, whole versus shards poorly glued together, should we dye our hair, get out the toques, the black t-shirts, leather jackets, bench press away the years? Our bodies, instruments, still strive to be strummed. Always room on the edge of exhilaration. Thank you, Fiona. Okay, and second to last, we have Pat Smeckle. Um, Pat is a writer from the News Bay. She has been published in over 70 publications in North America, the UK, and Australia, and is the author, co-author, or editor of seven collections of poetry, including this one. Hello, everyone. Uh, I have to, uh, first of all, congratulate all, all the poets that are in the book. Um, uh, because it's so interesting now to see faces uh, to match the poems that uh, Ian and I went over very carefully. It was very difficult to choose. Uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you all. Um, Anne-Marie, you said uh, that uh, we, we don't arrive at getting old. I'm sorry, but I've arrived. <laughs> I arrived on Saturday. <sighs> Horrors, <laughs> 86. But one of the nice things about getting old is some um, reminiscing. I'm so happy to have wonderful memories. Some memories that were a bit strange, but memories nonetheless, which um, kind of keep me going. So this poem is about things that take me back. Things that take me back. Foghorns still creep me out. Take me back to 43, my upstairs bedroom. Make me yank the covers up, block out Point Atkinson's eerie Ooh. Grasshoppers still jump all over me. Take me back to 45. The field I had to cross en route to Hefley's one room school. Miss Ray's gray suit and spinster bun. Daffodils still decorate the windowsill. Take me back to 56. Rossland Elementary, my grade twos, their painful handiwork with pipe cleaners, crepe paper. Astrakhan hats still bring chills. Take me back to 58, a frigid Finland welcome, Turku's moonscape 
shores, grim black booted men lined up. The scent of frangipani still delights me, takes me back to 61 first sights of Queensland, Sunrise Boulevard, exotic fruits, birds, blossoms. Land of hope and glory still marches me straight back to 72 raucous hilarity on Headley Street, seven revelers in full voice serenading neighbors. Such small things can lift a single moment out of now, strike its surface and ignite the past. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And uh, taking back and now taking home, Andrew Brown is gonna take us home with his final poem. And uh, Andrew is a poet from Qualicum Beach. He has published three books, Crow's First Word in 2007, The Stone Inside a Man's Heart in 2013, and Shadow Road in 2016. He is currently working on his fourth book, The Ghost Forest. Is it still that title, yeah. Andrew? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I think when I talked to you before, it was a working title. So, yeah. um, but it's a good title. So keep it. So, yeah. anyhow, Andrew, take us home with your poem. Okay. Well, thank you, Ian and Pat, for uh, your inclusion of my poem uh, from actually all the way back to uh, Crow's First Word. This poem is called All the Deaths. And um, I guess we're all at the point where we could. Uh, have a great party with uh, all the people we know who've uh, passed. And uh, so this, uh, this talks about that. It's called All the Deaths. All the deaths are found here, like small birds soaring, who fly into glass doors and then are laid out on the back porch with broken necks and startled eyes. This is how it is with all the deaths I've encountered. They come back not as ghosts or visit visitations from beyond, but suddenly, unexpectedly, they're lying broken with eyes like shards of glass just outside the door. Little mounds under the snow, small messages wrapped in the sheaf of remembrance and with the faces they wore the last time I saw them. All the deaths come in at the door, clapping hands against shoulders, stamping their feet against a cold more eternal than snow, more frigid than winter. And they pass close around me so that there is nowhere else to look but into the eyes of a dead loved one and to see myself reflected back, always myself, myself growing ever older, my hair graying, my skin translucent, like the parchment upon which all these deaths are written. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I think you beautifully sum up in that poem how um, I think in our youth week, we, we deflect age, but at some point we start absorbing a little more and what we see becomes what we see in our own path as well. And I think you, you, you really captured that in that poem. Uh, I think we've come to the end of the evening. I'd like to thank everyone who participated, uh, certainly the people who came just to listen, uh, the, the people who participated in, uh, in the book itself and also very much so to Vancouver Island Regional Library for hosting this event and making it possible. Um, there's a couple, there's just a few little business things that I wanna take care of um, if I can find them. Uh, one is uh, there is another event coming up soon and this is hosted by Fiona. Uh, it's I think every second Saturday of the month, correct me if I'm wrong, Fiona, and uh, it's uh, called Inverse, and it features four poets, and it's a really great format. 
Uh, it's really, really interesting to go to that. And uh, Fiona is a great host. So I strongly encourage people to be part of that. Um, the other thing is for anyone uh, interested in any of Repartee Press's books, there's a 20% sale right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you just use the value code bookends. Um, and for anyone who's <laughs> attended this event, just reference the event and uh, we can extend it into March. Um, so um, yeah, that's about it. Did you want to mention the other um, uh, swimming mermaid? The oh other... yes, the electric mermaid. Electric mermaid. Electric mermaid. <laughs> you know, uh, Carl is uh, well. Uh, uh, Char is the host or the sponsor. Uh, correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, Char, but of uh, the Electric Mermaid, which is another great series that occurs out of Port Alberni, and Carl is the moderator. And they, I have to tell you, they run a very tight ship because we did an event that involved, I think we had 17 writers and uh, doing a launch because that's where, where we did our first launch. And we also, um, there was also another feature writer and an open mic. And it was pretty seamless the way they operated the whole thing. It was very impressive. So uh, I strongly recommend that event as well. Yes. And that, when is that occurring, Carl? It, it's every, it's the third Friday of the month. So the next one is March 19th. Oh. Right. Um, so you can, Pre-register at Electric. I just put the email address on there. And if you just want to listen, you're going to go to charleslanding.com and it will have all the information because I can't not remember our feature readers this month, this next month. We have, always have great feature readers. Congratulations, Ian, on Zoom producing a wonderful evening. Thank yes, you, Ian and yeah. to Pat and to yeah, great. Darby. Darby. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank oh, you. It's great to be able to listen to stuff. Island Regional <laughs> Library, thank you. Yeah. Yes. yes. Share sure. for the library. Need more libraries to do this. <laughs> Absolutely. Even after COVID. Oh, uh, one thing I forgot, and I should have said this. I'm sorry, Darby, but uh, there are also five copies in circulation uh, of of uh, Old Bones and Battered Bookends at the um, Vancouver Island Regional Library. So um, they were very generously took quite a number of copies. So um, that's another way to get access to the book as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're done unless anybody wants to ask 